that the 520th Convocation of McMaster University for the conferring of degrees is now in session. Please be seated. Good morning. I am David Wilkinson, the Provost and Vice President Academic at McMaster. This morning I have the great pleasure of acting as your Master of Ceremonies for this convocation. Before we start our formal program, may I ask all of you to please turn off any electronic devices that may ring or beep during the ceremony. I would now like to call upon our Chancellor, Dr. Linton Wilson, to make his welcoming remarks. Very good morning to you all. President and Vice Chancellor, Provost, Dean Yates, our honorary graduate, members of the platform party, graduands, ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome to this 520th convocation of McMaster University. To our graduands, congratulations on your successes on reaching an important milestone, an exciting milestone in your lives. Many of you will begin careers embarking on new journeys. Some of you will be continuing your education, training, or preparation for more advanced or specialized activities. The very best of luck to each and every one of you. To the parents, grandparents, family members, spouses, and friends here today, I invite you to take a bow as well. You can be proud of the roles you've played in the accomplishments being recognized in this convocation. To our faculty and staff, today marks tangible recognition of your efforts, particularly the successes of your students evident in this ceremony. Thank you and congratulations. This is a day of celebration. I wish you all an enjoyable morning. Thank you. I would now like to introduce Dr. Patrick Dean, President and Vice Chancellor, who will be presenting our honorary degree recipient. Mr. Chancellor, by the authority of the Senate of McMaster University, I have the honor to present Maria Mutagamba. The Honorable Maria Mutagamba is the Member of Parliament from the Rakhai District of Uganda the former Minister of Water, Lands and Environment, and since 2012, the Minister of Tourism, Wildlife and Antiquities in Uganda's Cabinet. Ms. Mutagamba graduated with a degree in economics from Makarere University and worked in finance and policy positions with the Bank of Uganda, E.T. Monks, the Alliance Building Society, African Textile Mill, and the Bank of Baroda. She has also been, since 1997, the proprietor of Greenpoint Enterprises. Ms. Mutagamba entered politics in 1989 when she ran successfully for office. As a member of parliament, she founded the Rakhai Development Association, the Orphans Community Based Organization, OCBO, and the Rakhai Foster Parents Association. By 1996, 
She had become Deputy Secretary General of the Democratic Party of Uganda and a member of the Reconciliation Committee, as well as the chairperson of two presidential election campaigns. Ms. Mutagamba's work with women, particularly with foster parents in rural communities, led her to become concerned about the deplorable state of water and sanitation in her home country. She recognized that poor water quality, lack of access to potable water, the continuing practice of open defecation and the sewage runoff into sources of drinking water were literally killing the women and children of Uganda. To address these concerns, Ms. Mutagamba became a water issues advocate and ambassador in her multiple roles as the vice chair of the United Nations Task Force on Integrated Water Resource Management, as patron of the Global Water Harvesting Network, as president of the African Minister's Council on Water, as chairperson of the Nile Basin Initiative, and most recently, as a member of the United Nations Secretary General's Advisory Board on Water and Sanitation. From 2000 to 2006, while she was the Ugandan Minister of Water, Lands and Environment, Ms. Mutagamba also served as the coordinator of the Global Women Leaders Forum for Water and Sanitation. This organization is committed to highlighting and promoting worldwide gender equality in the decision-making and management of water supply and sanitation systems. Applying her training in economics, Ms. Mutagamba has effectively linked the state of water and sanitation to economic development. She has been influential in negotiating with donor agencies and foreign investors to include water and sanitation among their priorities, and she has refused to allow water degradation to be the price of investment in Uganda. Her insistence that women be represented by women on local water planning committees has advanced both the state of water and the status of women in Uganda. Under Ms. Mutagamba's leadership, Uganda is moving toward meeting Millennium Goal 7 of increasing sustainable access to safe drinking water and basic sanitation. And her efforts have been responsible for a significant reduction in infant mortality caused by waterborne pathogens. Ms. Mutagamba is also a strong advocate for the preservation of the environment. She has worked to educate the public about the benefits of tree planting and forestation in mitigating the impacts of climate change and improving soil conditions. And she is an advocate of the Ramsar principles of sustainable use and conservation of wetlands and ecosystems. Mr. Chancellor, the Honorable Maria Mutagamba is a pioneer of the African environmental movement, a highly effective advocate for the rights of all people to safe and clean water, and a visionary leader who has connected issues related to water, social equality, and economics in order to enhance the health and futures of families in Uganda and beyond. I ask, Mr. Chancellor, that you confer upon her the degree Doctor of Laws, honoris causa. Maria Mutagamba, by the authority of McMaster University Senate, I have the great pleasure to confer upon you the degree Doctor of Laws honoris causa in McMaster University with all the rights and privileges pertaining to that degree. Congratulations. Come and sign the book. It's now my great pleasure 
to invite Dr. Mutagamba to deliver the convocation address. Dr. Mutagamba. Thank you very much, the Vice Chancellor, sir, the President and members of the Senate of McMaster University, the Registrar and distinguished members of the academia, academia, members of these convocations, invited guests, ladies and gentlemen. It is my honest, highest, and singular honor to stand before you first to express my heartfelt appreciation of the honor bestowed upon me by this convocation. I take it with both humility, humbleness, and gratitude. I'm encouraged to believe in my further steps of service to humanity through water sanitation and hygiene promotion, especially on the continent of Africa. Allow me, Mr. Chancellor, to appreciate in your presence people in this congregation who have worked so hard to make me visible here today. First, I want to thank the United Nations systems, the Secretary General, and all the bodies that related to water and sanitation. It is with this United Nations body and institution that have been able to achieve what I've achieved today. I really want to ask the congregation to clap for the Secretary General and the United Nations. Thank you very much. I also want to take this opportunity, sir, to talk about one brother of mine seated in the middle there called Tim. Tim, I met Tim five years ago in my search for a solution for water on the continent. And I shared with him my anxieties, my aspirations, my vision. And he made sure I didn't keep quiet. He told other people, and that's how I ended up at McMaster University last year and today. Thank you, Tim. I want to thank Professor Susan. You know, she's been more or less like an angel in making sure that what I do becomes visible. I'm a quiet operator. I move quietly. But Susan has always been there to say, yes, this one ought to be known. Thank you, Susan, and all the colleagues you have worked with. Allow me at this juncture to introduce my personal assistant, Priska Nandede. She's been my angel. She's still my angel. She's always there for me, and I really want to appreciate you in this August house. And also allow me, lastly, to, to thank my family, here represented by my last born, my son, Paul Michael Mutagamba, who have stood with me and have actually had to appreciate the sacrifice I make at times on their resources and their time. Thank you, Michael, and convey my regards to the family. Mr. Chancellor, ladies and gentlemen, mine has been a humble life, a life of committed service, and that's what I have, you have honored today. It's not the Mutagamba you see here, but the life of service and commitment. I stand here on behalf of the women of Africa who every day have to walk distances to fetch water on their heads with children at the back. And this is dirty water. And that's what has been motivating me. And it is what you have recognized in today's honorary degree. I take it with all humbleness. Last year in April, when I was still a minister for water, I was honored by my colleague, the Ministers of Water in Africa, under the initiative of African Ministerial Council on Water, and I was called Mama Water Africa. It's a big title. I loved it, just like I now enjoy the honorary doctorate that I've received. But it brought a challenge to me, because I had to make sure that I leave something behind for Mama Water Africa. And I didn't know that six months down the road, I would be transferred from water to tourism where I am now. So in order to do that, Mr. Chancellor, I've had to start an initiative 
called Mama Water Africa Foundation in order to propel the initiatives of women of Africa to make sure that water and sanitation and hygiene are brought at the high level and maintained at the high agenda of the global and African community. At, this, at a later time, Mr. Chancellor, sir, I'll give you a portrait of Mama Water Africa, a foundation that I hope is going to be working closely with the University of McMaster, especially in the research and information sharing. But of course, being Mama Water means uh, a continent where we have only 55% of the population of the continent accessing clean, safe water. A continent where we have less than, where we have more than 65% without adequate sanitation. This is a continent where we have more than 400 million people going hungry because they don't have food. This is a continent, and particularly my country, where we have more than 2.4 million stunted children under the age of five because they are undernourished. And all this resolves around water. So we have a challenge. This is the region, on the other hand, which suffers with one season of heavy downfall. Every saving is washed away. And on the other hand, this is an area where a three months of drought will mean children and women going into the wilderness to look for leaves to chew in order to get water in their mouth. This is the continent where I'm called Mama Water. This is the continent that we have recognized today. And this is a continent where we still believe that investing in water is a luxury as compared to other priorities. And therefore, I was more than honored just a few months ago when the Secretary General, no, earlier this year, when the Secretary General of the UN declared 2013 a year of cooperation on water. That means we are going to cooperate. I want to start appreciating the cooperation you have given me, given Africa through the University of McMaster. But it means a lot more. We've got to cooperate between sectors. We've got to cooperate between professionals. At the moment, Africa is lagging behind the Millennium Development Goals, simply because we have failed to come up with appropriate technologies that can solve the problem. We are left with only two years of cooperation to make it happen or make it or break it. So what do we have to do to make that difference? Can Africa still make it? We need to come up with a strategy that is going to make Africa realize the Millennium Go Development Goals. And my vision, my vision, and which I want to share with the convocation today here, is that in Africa, the fastest way to do things right in terms of water and sanitation is the rainwater harvesting. That is the technology. I want to invite all engineers of the world, engineers of Canada, engineers of Uganda, engineers of Africa, to put their heads together within the next two years to solve a problem. And I think you can do it. Because the technology is known. Everybody has its water. It's a matter of adding a few skills here and there, and we'll have everybody having water, both for consumption and for production. And we shall have less of our women trekking journeys to look for water. Ladies and gentlemen, when I joined in August last year, I joined the Ministry of Tourism, Wildlife and Antiquities. I thought I was lost, I was lost the water sector. But I'm happy that in this year, tourism theme of the year, the Secretary General of the United Nations World Travel Organization has declared tourism and water as the theme for this year. So I find my bearing again, and I believe that we are going to work together. I want to invite you to Uganda as tourists, mindful of the water resources, mindful of the common future. And I want to thank you, Mr. Chancellor, for bestowing on me the greatest honor of this university. Thank you very much for going on my country. Thank you very much, Dr. Mutagamba, for those inspirational words. It's evident that 
your leadership in Uganda, in Africa, among women, particularly on this issue of water, has borne fruit, successful. You pursued it with modesty, but determination. And it's evident that you've been successful. We're delighted to have you with us this morning. Congratulations. Dr. Patrick Dean will now come forward to present the graduands to our chancellor for admission to their degrees. Will the graduands please stand? Mr. Chancellor, on behalf of McMaster University Senate, I present to you these candidates in order that you may confer the appropriate degrees upon them. And I bear witness that they are worthy and suitable. Graduands, by my authority and that of the McMaster University Senate, I have the great pleasure to admit you to your individual degrees in McMaster University with all of the rights and privileges pertaining to those degrees. My sincere congratulations to you all. Please be seated. Mr. Chancellor, on behalf of McMaster University Senate, may I also request that you confer the appropriate degrees in absentia upon all those candidates who have successfully completed the required course of study, but who are not present. I declare all these degrees conferred in absentia. Graduates, I now ask each of you to join me on stage so that the Chancellor and I may welcome you into the McMaster Community of Scholars.
ladies and gentlemen, so that each graduand's name may be heard, it would be appreciated if during the presentation of the graduands, you would hold your applause to the end of each degree category. Thank you. Mr. Chancellor, may I present to you the following graduate of the degree Doctor of Philosophy, Stephanie Amanda Howells, plus one. Mr. Chancellor, may I present to you the following graduate of the degree, Master of Arts, Christina Merla. <laughs> Mr. Chancellor, may I present to you the following graduate of the degree, Master of Social Work, Jennifer Ann Codlin. Mr. Chancellor, may I present to you the following graduates of the degree Bachelor of Arts Honours. Samantha Abudulad. Shema Bassan Abusidu. Agnieszka Adamiak. Alana Marie Agro. Warda Amar. Aranola Akinbobola. Rebecca Alderson. Sabrina Lynn Anacleto. <laughs> Megan Alexandra Anderson. Trent Alexander Angiers. Sarah Archer. Lama Arabi. Brittany Arrowsmith. Veronica Lee Atterwell. Dana Patricia Baker. Bianca Roxandra Balterato. <laughs> Ashley Nicole Battaglia. Yeah. Adrian Deborah Beaumont. Gershon Bedi. Sarah Elizabeth Rose Bellier. Sarah Adele Bon. Christina Borges.
Emily Brooke Bolt. Christy Bowick. Adam Broad. Emily Grace Brown. Botond Eric Budai. Alexander Patrick Burnett. Carla Carranza. Sophia Catania. Vincy Wing Yi Chung. Kiran Chuti. Victoria Mary Coates. Michelle Tina Cochran. Catherine Medeiros Correa. Casenio Crawford. Ryan Cumming, Cummins. Ashley Zhuan Dang. Megan Janelle Davis. Davina Dea. Cassandra Patsy DeCoste. Nada Janerlovich. Elena Rochelle Doucette. Hope Yvonne Dugal. Claire Hope Isles. Christopher Aiden Alexandra Falco. Laura Christine Farrell. <laughs> Emily Ferguson. Monique Otrin Flynn. Nicole Forbes. Shannon Nicole Forche. Shadeen Odessa Francis. Bianca Fung. Janita Gajar. Anessa Marissa Garcia. Deidreanne Gardner. Morella Gedja. Lisa Giles.
Anna Patricia Gonzalez. Shanika Gordon. Christine Marie Denise Grabna. Kayla Grand. Alexis Caitlin Grant. Stephanie Amanda Greenaway. Melissa Louise Griffiths. Veronica Gronkowska. Sandra Gurgis. Salima Halari. Bailey Halkovich. Stacy Hancock. Kristen Henley. Brittany Lynn Hodecki. Christy Diane Elizabeth Howe. Nicole Victoria Hutchick. Jennifer Ishi. Anna Marie Jakubowski. Julia Barbara Maria Jankowski. Tamika Jarvis. Nicholas William Jeffrey. <laughs> Yu Shi Jin. Kayla Marie Johnston. Hillary Dorothy Jones. Rebecca Jones. Julia Margaret Kelly. Bridget Leanne Kerr. Valerie May King. Emily Catherine Korea Kupolis. <clears throat> Ashley Patricia Klimp Dalton. <clears throat> Robert Bai Cheng Ku. <clears throat> Matthew Christopher Kubicki. Robin Charlotte Lafferty. Woo! Melissa Ann Latchford. Cam Man Lau. Okay. 
Alison Sonali Fabian Leonage. Brittany Lee. Amber Marie Lindsay. <clears throat> Robin Lintner. Jamie May Mary Listen. Wing Lamb Jackie Luke. Alexandria Nicole Lynch. Gareth Wayne McDonald. Jessica Spring McKenzie. Megan Heather McLeod. Sydney Diana McLeod. Mel Melanie Maori. Jade Mary Gail Malta. Kaitlin Rita Mapp. Kimoy and Tori Marston. Kirsty Martin. Tara Martin. Emily and Victoria Mataskeel. Marin Saunders Maynard. Catherine McCoy. Stephanie Amber McDermott. Megan Alicia McFarlane. Emily Blair McKenzie. Leah Elizabeth McLean. Kathleen McNally. Sarah Elizabeth Medeiros. Catherine Mendoza. Rosalie Elaine Metzger. Haley Elizabeth Malutinovich. Haley Melissa Moya. Lindsay Marie Murphy. Colleen Muscat. David Nan. Allison Patricia Neal. Edward Paul Nicole.
Emberly Jane Nicholson. Raluca Nutza. Brittany Ogilvy. Corinne Alexandra McCauley Oliver. Nicole Orlando. Alexandria Giovanna Pasquini. Sarah Patterson. Diva Pasnikas. Nashara Ashley Latoya Peart. Amelia Pendleton. Angela Perry. Sarah Policelli. Caitlin Elizabeth Post. James Terry Priestman. Nalini Christina Raman Wilms. Carly Renee Redborn St. Anne. Sarah Jane Reese. Alyssa Jane Robinson. Samantha Romlewski. Danielle Morgan Russell. Stephanie Bergita Teresa Russell. Enrico Paolo Sabatino. Andeep Sahota. Navdeep Sahota. Ruby Glaceria Salazar. Christina Salaturo. Danusha Subani Sumara Sekera. Courtney Sanderson. Leanne Christine Sawicki. Martin Sawicki. Stephen Schneider. Alexandra Taylor Scro. Kelly Marie Shantz. Sarah Allison Sherwood. Brittany Michelle Seaman.
Dylan Simone. Thurka Sivakumar. Sahana Sivakumaran. Spencer Skidmore. Stella Sma. Olinfun Milolo Feaseo Soranmade. Katrina Mariel Sormaz. Mallory Solange Sousa. Stephanie Marie Sousa. Allison Jill Suta. Michelle Maria Spadafora. Brendan Michael Stanley. Michael Robert Stevens. Carl Storbeck. Paola Succi. Laura Michelle Taglioni. <laughs> Melissa Ashley Thomas. Dana Marianne Thompson. Christina May Thorpe. Madison Lynn Toth. Calvin Wei Lun Sang. Magdalena Cebu Darko. Christopher Valeri. <laughs> Yuri Cesar Varela Melara. Danielle Vela. Olivia Virag. Nicole Lee Visser. Zora Vuong. Patrick Adrian Vusier. Roshi Wagley. Jessica Z. Wang. Melanie Amber Warren. Samantha Watt. Krista Wigman.
Sarah Woodhouse. Reem Yamani. Samantha Catherine Younger. Jessica Zack. Mr. Chancellor, may I present to you the following graduates of the degree Bachelor of Arts, Bachelor of Social Work. Brianna Renell Bar Barrow Chisholm. Alicia Beloszewski. Jeffrey James Black. Lauren Rachel Bayel. Rebecca Claus. Samantha Megan Cohen. Bethany Noel Cowley. Tristan Dart. Ashley Joanne Michelle Gallagher. Simone Felicia Gomez. Rachel Kimberly Halstra. Lindsay Christina Hartwick. Brandy Hemsworth. Nicole Louise Hiltz. Jennifer Stephanie Anna Jacks. Shay Rebecca Johnson. Melissa Ann Cook. Sandra Lord. Violetta Christy Nikolskaya. Leslie Norman. Nastasia Palonka. Ashley Pancoast. Grace Park. Catherine Elsie Penny. Andrea Leanne Petty. Amanda Elizabeth Grace Pond.
Joanna Michelle Smith. Summer Staniff. Patricia Tatum. <laughs> Lakaisha Helen Nicole Thomas. Leia Trebashnik. Mary Elizabeth Vaccaro. Christina Natalie Valenti. Celeste Maxwell Vanderbent. Stephanie Grace Vrugden Hill. Mr. Chancellor, may I present to you the following graduates of the degree Bachelor of Social Work. Shazi Yasmin Bokhari. Mary Ellen Cerconi. Rachel Ann Cordina. Nadia Marie de Rosa. Jordan West Fraser. Angela Dawn Eve. Laura Kovacic. Sandra McKay. David John McCallum. Katerina Beatrice McCrindle. Neil Solomon. Thank you. Kayla Ryan. Lauren Snellius. Alexandra Jane Stoat. Gregory Tedesco. <laughs> Tiffany Tukic. <laughs> Amy Renee Wellington. <laughs> Graham Blair Wood.
Mr. Chancellor, may I present to you the following graduates of the degree, Bachelor of Arts. Mary Abdullahad. Olushina Akinwande. Petra Amanovich. Sarah Michelle Amatruda. Danielle Marina Arbor. Isabel Ardiente. Kristen Ann Baldinelli. Daniel Balkasun. <laughs> Heather Nicole Ball. Jessica Barker. <laughs> Kaylee Patricia Burkett. Kara Jane Box. Tonya Brock. Alexandra Victoria Brodka. Sarah Ashley Brooks. Julie Lee Brooks. Christopher Ryan Buttonham. Caitlin Elizabeth Cahill. Megan Nicole Kalnan. Anthony Carioni. Shah Jahan Chaudhry. Jane Sujen Chen. Kristen Chedorowski. Cynthia Chowdhury. <laughs> Jessica Messner. Jennifer Dowler Craig. Erin Michelle Crawford. Jessica Zachuski. Danielle Joelle D'Souza. Ryan Michael Mikhail Derachuk. Katie Digby. Katrina Dong. Deanna Ducero. Ariana 
Echiandia Spillman. James Charles Newton Edwards. Leslie Ann Emery. Hmm. Jessica Noel Field. Sarah Ann Figuerdo. Lisa Fierasso. Claudia Frack. Ryan Bradley Freed. Kelly Victoria Frost. Ning Ning Fu. Sarah Sky Gardner Presley. Kelly Totten Garvey. Amanda Getchell. Alicia Giftopoulos. Mark Thomas Gizmondi. Petra Golub. Christina Anna Greco. Aaron Kathleen Hamilton. Rachel Diana Harris. Aspen Haynes. Jacqueline Margaret Hornby. Delia Felicity Hutchinson. Shanice Christina Jeffers. Biliana Gelasic. Elise Melissa Judges. Kayla Marys Calatil. Almira Kamaludin. Sajika Kanagalindam. Karima Kapoor. Michael Anthony Keenan. Caleb Kennedy. Jacqueline Kahn. Olivia Kong. Ashley Margaret Kirick.
Alessandra Kwan. Patricia Kwasnick. Annette Maria Labak. Christopher Lalonde. Andrew J. Lawler. Allison Marie Lee. Rachel Elise Lehman. Michelle Lynn Lossack. Jessica Jane Mackey. Michael Albert Mannon. Aisha Akila Martin. Andrew McKenzie. Vanessa Mesta. Ksenia McAuliffe. Ashley Louise Morgan. Sharenya Mutharaja Lingam. Sheena Nadu. Nerlin Sheshi. Alicia Dawn Normanton. Joyce Nusiano Nayamadi. Marco Joseph Palladino. Michelle Pearson. Rafal Pilashek. Fred James Priestley. Kristen Regis. Cole Evan Ridsdale. Yes. Callie Robinson. Laura Romano. Stephanie Teresa Romano. Florence Rosato. Zunera Sajid. Kiran Sandu. Brooke Shana Seguin. Paul Anthony Satimi. Oh. Owen Shad. Yay. 
Tanya Sharma. Melanie Silva. Ashley Irene Simeonides. Michelle Yvonne Sinclair. Kelsey Lynn Spence. Holly Spencer. Robert Stanislaus. Malcolm Stanley. Brooke Dawn Steers. Katie Tanuti. Victoria Kathleen Thibodeau. David Julian Robert Timpano. Michelle Tucci. Brian Tung. Heather Lindsay Van Kirkhoven. Marlene Velasco. Rochelle Sylvie Marie Vink. Kelsey Visser. John David Waldock. Katie Watson. Megan Elizabeth White. Stephen Matthew Wilczynski. Christopher Scott Wills. Muriel Isabel Wolanski. Alexandra K. Wong. <laughs> Stephanie Elise Wright. <laughs> Angela Johan. <laughs> Sabrina Zabodsky. Ying Mei Zhang. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I would now like to introduce you to Mr. Simon Granite a graduate of the Bachelor of Arts Honors Program who will be delivering the valedictory address. Thank you, Mr. Chancellor, President Dean, Dean Yates, 
distinguished guests, parents, and most importantly, my fellow graduates. Let me start by saying this, congratulations. Today is our day. We should enjoy it, cherish every minute of it, love our family. For today, we are not just united by faculty, but by history. Since the first graduating class in 1894, McMaster graduates have sat where we are, and they felt the same way we do. They felt a lump in their gut, a feeling of angst, a feeling of uncertainty about the future. But those graduates, they went on to do great things. Graduates like Roberta Bondar reached for the stars and Tommy Douglas built Canada's healthcare system. And graduates like my mother, who graduated from political science here at McMaster in 1981, and she did one of the greatest things that I think anyone can do. She built a loving family. My mother's experiences at McMaster, her education, her extracurriculars, shaped who she is today, and they shaped who I am. Today, we truly stand on the shoulders of giants, united by history. We have one of the best educations in the world. We've studied alongside world-class professors, professors who taught us to critically ask questions about the world around us, and to ask why things happen. Starting on the first day of the first year, those professors planted seeds of inquiry in our minds, and today, we can witness the full bloom of their efforts, and it is beautiful. To those professors, we say thank you. The endless all-nighters and cups of coffee in Mel's library were worth it, because today, we are now social scientists. But our experience at McMaster, it's not just about academics. Extracurriculars not only give social scientists the perfect outlet to test how human interactions work, but they teach us who we are. For me, as a political science major, that experience was as a representative in the McMaster Students' Union. There, I opened our food bank for the summer. And as a direct result, we fed over 60 meals to students who had no other way to eat. That single policy change also added to the character of the university. And in one small measure, it's what I feel I gave back to McMaster. President John F. Kennedy once said, man holds in his mortal hands the power to abolish all forms of human poverty and all forms of human life. And he said that in 1961. Today is 2013, and our future is even more limitless. No one in this room understands that potential better than Linton Wilson, a fellow McMaster graduate who sat where we are in 1962. Through his leadership during an exceptional career in public service over the last half century, he has shown us what may be done with the foundation of a McMaster liberal arts degree. Today, he presides over one of his last convocations after nearly six years as the titular head of our university. Mr. Chancellor, for your example and for your service, we say thank you. <laughs> university is a journey, but that journey doesn't end here today. With our academics and with our extracurriculars, with what McMaster has given us and with what we have given it, we will boldly enter the next chapter of our lives and we will make past generations, future generations, and our generation of McMaster graduates proud. Thank you. Simon, thank you so very much for putting into words and expressing the, the gratitude for the McMaster experience and the aspirations for the future that I'm sure are held in the hearts of all of the graduates here today. May I now call upon our president, Dr. Patrick Dean, who will be presenting the President's Award for Outstanding Contributions to Teaching and Learning. Would uh, Dr. Gary Dumbrell please, please come forward. For more than 10 years, Dr. Gary Dumbrell, Associate Professor in the School of Social Work, has demonstrated excellence in teaching. He has received the McMaster Student Union Teaching Award in the Faculty of Social Science on two occasions. 
His teacher ratings are consistently in the excellent range. Comments by his students indicate their appreciation for his teaching methods and their learning success under his mentorship. Dr. Dumbrell articulates a clear teaching philosophy that involves disrupting the boundaries between academic and non-academic domains. He encourages students to see how academic knowledge will help them to make sense of events in the outside world. He prefers to develop a dialogue with students rather than lecture them, and he works to stimulate each student's personal and intellectual growth. Dr. Dumbrell uses his scholarly activities to show students how theoretical knowledge and social work practice mutually support each other. His exceptional teaching contribution is in bringing learning in the community to the university domain. He has formed collaborations through teaching and research with Six Nations so that both Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal students can learn together in a mutually safe and supportive environment. His sensitivity to cultural differences and to the different learning needs of, of children in socially disadvantaged situations, such as Crown Wards, leads him to establish learning environments where his students can dialogue safely in areas that might otherwise lead to tension. Even within large classes, Dr. Dumbrell attempts to engage students with their feelings during learning so that they become aware of the emotional aspects of the practice of social work. Dr. Dumbrell is also actively involved in mentoring graduate students and in sharing his expertise in workshops, publications, and presentations across campus within his discipline and within the community. Dr. Dumbrell exemplifies the integration of research, teaching, and community involvement that we value here at McMaster. He is a most deserving recipient of the President's Award for Outstanding Contributions to Teaching and Learning. Congratulations, Dr. Dumbrell. Very well done. We'll have your photo here. May I call upon the Dean of Social Sciences, Dr. Charlotte Yates, who will be presenting the J.E.L. Graham Medal and the R.C. McIver Medal. It is with great pleasure that I announce the winner of the J.E.L. Graham Medal for Outstanding Academic Achievements in the Faculty of Social Sciences. Please come up, Catherine Penny, to receive your award. It is also with great pleasure that I present Victoria Coates with the R.C. McIver Medal for Outstanding Academic Achievement in the Faculty of Social Sciences. Please come up, Victoria. May I introduce to you Ms. Suzanne Craven, a representative of the McMaster Alumni Association, who will now deliver the Alumni Association Address. Chancellor Wilson, President Dean, McMaster faculty, fellow alumni, honored guests, 
members of the McMaster class of 2013. There is an unwritten contract that says that everyone who speaks at convocation must offer advice to the graduating class. So in preparing my comments, I tried to recall what I wanted to hear on my day of graduation from Mac, which more shocking to me perhaps than to you, was 40 years ago this month, almost to the day. But what I remember most, aside from sitting in a hot gymnasium on very hard chairs, was hoping that I would hear someone say, I'm offering you this job for $100,000 a year <laughs> and a new car. <laughs> if you would just sign here. <laughs> Instead, I happily reveled at the idea of being a new graduate with great hopes to follow my own dreams. Today, you graduate with a bag full of knowledge, but that bag is actually full of the seeds of wisdom that carefully nourished will grow into your own grand experiences in life. Look ahead. Follow your passion, because that's where your heart is, and that's where your success will be also. Today, you and everyone with you is delighted at your convocation, and perhaps you think now that your educational life is over, and what might be surprising to you in September is how much you miss the university, the campus, the friends, the classes, and the many options provided to you to enjoy life outside of class. But there's more, and thousands of us are living examples of this. McMaster was not my only university experience. Rather, I have two postgraduate degrees from other Ontario universities, but my heart always stayed with McMaster. I guess it was because of the grounding of my first degree and the wonderful people I met and the special experiences that I had in this place. The fact is, I never really left. I joined the McMaster Alumni Association in a very real way. I actually went to their get-togethers, their meetings, their lectures, activities. And I found that my networking experiences increased as more friendships grew. McMaster, you see, is not a place that you leave behind easily. It's a place that continues to encourage and challenge you your whole life long. So today, I invite you not to stray too far, but to continue to enjoy the many offerings of your university and to spread your wings to get involved on a whole new level. We look forward to your input as well as we ask new grads to provide wisdom to incoming Mac students. We think this kind of support from one generation of the McMaster family to the next is important because every McMaster class, regardless of era, shares at least two things with all others. The first is the great potential you have as new graduates of one of the world's truly great universities. The second is that we all share in the familial connection with McMaster and with to each other, and a responsibility to build on the legacy that we have inherited. The McMaster Alumni Association is here to help you maintain that lifelong connection. You have in your hands the convocation booklet that describes our programs. You're invited to be part of MAC-10, a program just for grads of the last decade. Watch for the alumni magazine, the McMaster Times, in your mailbox or online, or be part of the association's online community. Follow us on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, or Flickr. And believe it or not, before long, 
you too will be seeking out the alumni value-added services like home, auto, and life insurance. Join your fellow alumni at one of the hundreds of events we organize annually in Hamilton, across Canada, and around the world. There is a place for all of you at the McMaster Alumni Association and ways to remain connected from casual users of our social media to being a highly engaged volunteer like our chancellor, a proud member of the class of 62 upon whom the McMaster Alumni Association just bestowed its highest honor, the Distinguished Service Award. To the class of 2013, we celebrate your success as students and toast the promise of your futures as alumni of this university. Your fellow Mac grads are proud to welcome you to the McMaster alumni family. Congratulations. May I invite Dr. Dean back to the podium to deliver his president's address. Well, the ceremony has been wonderful, as convocation always is. It has been a celebration of all of you and of your individual achievements, of the McMaster family, uh, in which, as of today, you've succeeded to a different kind of membership, and of our society, which accords to universities a privileged status and generous support, in return for which we provide not only brilliant and energetic leaders for tomorrow, but also the new ideas and discoveries that will shape our future. Convocation is a communal event because it celebrates our community, its values, and its aspirations. And this is a time to contemplate where you fit in, not only within the McBaster community, although Suzanne just gave you some very good ideas about how you might fit in there, but more broadly, how you might fit into our society and in our world. Three years ago, at my first McMaster convocation, I tried to describe where I saw myself fitting in and I spoke about the idea of education as integrity, about my belief that education is diminished in its value and in its effect when it falls out of touch with the full range, the full panoply of lived human concerns. So in keeping with that belief, the question I would ask you to consider today is this. Where will your university education eventually find its value? And where would you hope to see its greatest effect? How will your life as the proud holder of a McMaster degree intersect with and address the large questions facing our species and our planet? Ronald Dworkin, the eminent legal philosopher from whom I quoted on this platform three years ago, identifies the issue in this way. This is what he says. Living must be more than finding oneself pulled by unexamined habit through worn grooves of expectation and reward. And he continues, no respectable or even intelligible theory of value supposes that making and spending money has any value or importance in itself, and almost everything people buy with that money lacks any importance as well. Those are Dworkin's words. Dworkin prompts us to be always mindful of the value of what we do, and to understand value in qualitative rather than quantitative terms. Value is something that resides in relationship in between people, between people and things, 
between people and ideas, between people and the planet. And it is to be measured, if it is to be measured at all, in effect. There's another section in Dworkin which expresses the notion very beautifully, if rather bleakly, in this way. Uh, this is what he says. The only value we can find in living in the foothills of death as we do is adverbial value. It's about adverbs, descriptive words. How we live is a question of value. That we live and die is merely a matter of fact. Ronald Dworkin died at the age of 81 in February of this year. And in his last major work, which appeared in 2011, he tried to provide an overview of his work, which brought together a number of the strands in which he had worked throughout his career, political philosophy, moral philosophy, the theory of interpretation, and so on. The book has a lovely, enigmatic, and alluring title. It is called Justice for Hedgehogs. This reminds me of that phrase, votes for women, or freedom for such and such. It's actually this title derived uh, from a line by the ancient Greek poet Archilochus, which exists only as a, a, a tiny fragment. It's a line that was popularized in the early part of the 20th century by Isaiah Berlin. And the line goes this way. The fox knows many things, but the hedgehog knows one big thing. And Dworkin uses this line to contrast two ways of viewing the world. The first, which regards phenomena and experiences as serial, separate, individual, while the second, the one he associates with the hedgehog, sees phenomena as not merely connected, but integrated, not a series, but a singularity. For Dworkin, value is one big thing. Now, I'm not going to try to unpack this assertion in all its complexity, except to refer you back to my observation that value is something which resides in relationships that has no existence outside of relationships. And at one level, this simply means that the realm of ethics and morals is community, the network of relationships through which we have an opportunity to do more than merely live. It also means that moral and ethical values are of necessity interconnected and interdependent. A life does not realize its potential value through compartmentalization. Consider this scenario. To be ruthless and uncompromising in the workplace, in the office, in the pursuit of profit, yet loving and solicitous in the bosom of the family. What kind of a life is it that unites those two things? And what can we say about its value? If value resides in the adverbs which describe our actions and the adjectives which describe us, how does that equation which links ruthlessness to lovingness work out? Does it resolve as zero? Only the hedgehog knows. The point about the hedgehog's view that is worth remembering is this. The value of a life is the sum of its qualitative interactions with the world, immediate and remote, direct and indirect, private and public, professional and recreational. And integrity, as we commonly understand the word, resides in the consistency with which we apply ourselves in all of those realms. We have integrity when we act not according to values that change with circumstance, but as if our value as persons is one big thing. Now, Notwithstanding Dworkin's very critical comments about the value of money and what can be bought for it, uh, with it, the world of finance does provide an analogy useful 
for thinking about the project of being a worthwhile human being. In the same way that your accountant, if you don't have one now, when you eventually have one, in the same way that your accountant won't allow you in the final analysis to separate your assets from your liabilities, won't let you ignore the latter and concentrate on the former just because to do so makes you feel wealthier, the hedgehog insists that in accounting for the value of your being on earth, everything must be counted in. Now, I observed as uh, you crossed the platform this morning that in anticipation for today's convocation, many of you seem to have invested in some new clothes. New shirt, a tie, dress, shoes perhaps. I actually even noticed yesterday someone crossed the platform with the label still attached to their, <laughs> their sleeve. Now, I'm not a shopping theorist or expert, now, merely like most people, I'm an occasionally enthusiastic amateur. But I know that into your deliberations at the rack in the clothes store will sooner or later have come thoughts about the value of the garment you were thinking of buying. A primary consideration for most people would be the asking price, which as you move from considerations of affordability and then to use, turns into an assessment of that garment's value for you. And typically, the context within which we find and attribute value to a shirt or a dress is very narrow. The garment may earn you, you hope, a certain cachet in a fashionable circle into which you'd like to move. It may say something about you that you would like to have said. Or sometimes, a garment, like many things in life, may simply delight your eye. St. Thomas has a lovely statement about beauty. It runs this way in Latin, pulchrum est id quod visum placet, which translates as, beauty is that which being seen pleases. Beauty is in some cases tautological. But value is neither essential nor tautological, however. Things have different value for different people in different circumstances. And in the kind of commercial moment I've just been describing, that garment you were thinking of buying becomes simply a nexus for various intersecting value propositions. Yours, the stores, the manufacturers, the advertisers. And interestingly, it's in the interest of all those people, especially the retailer, to keep the context within which you assess the value of their commodity simple and narrow to compartmentalize the buyer with the product so that only value of the most personal kind can be attributed or, dis or discovered. So going back to Archilochos and the contrast between the hedgehog and the fox, I would say that commerce functions by making foxes of us all. It encourages us to encounter the world serially and without reference to the one big Thing. So after the April 24th collapse of the Rana Plaza garment factory in Bangladesh, which killed more than 1,100 workers, can shopping for clothes ever again be the kind of fox-like, somewhat self-involved activity I've been describing? No doubt for some people it can and will. There will be those, I suppose, whose capacity for compartmentalization is so advanced that exploitation and human suffering expended in the production of a garment does not factor in their assessment of its value to them. I thought of this recently in the men's section of a well-known department store where for the first time I noticed, uh, because recent ev events had prompted me to be thoughtful about these things, that by far the majority of shirts available were made in Bangladesh, where, as we all recently learned, for many of us to our surprise, the worker's life is sometimes cheap to her employer, and where the minimum monthly salary for a garment worker is 3,000 takas approximately $38, or approximately half of what my Canadian retailer 
is asking me to pay for one of the thousands of shirts shipped from that factory every day. My purpose today is not to debate the merits and demerits of commerce or to venture into the realm of business ethics. Instead, I've seized upon the Bangladesh garment workers' tragedy and our daily involvement with it through the clothes we buy and wear as an illustration of why it is impossible to live a good life without taking the hedgehog's view, without understanding that value, as we ascribe it to our lives, to others, and to objects, is one big thing. Or rather, we must at all times behave as if it is one big thing. The inhumane treatment of workers in Bangladesh must be reckoned by me as I assess the value of a garment I'm being invited to purchase. If I do not do that, my own value as a human being is diminished. In Ian Forster's novel, Howard's End, his character, Margaret Schlegel, uh, is given a lovely exhortation which she directs at her family members. Only connect, she says, only connect. Live in fragments no longer. And in Dworkin's analogy, it is the hedgehog who sees the world in its interconnectedness and who understands his own value in being of the whole and acting for the good of the whole. So this convocation ceremony provides an opportunity to ask you to take your McMaster degrees and go out into the world in the same spirit. If not confident in your ability to transform the world, at least determined to live in it with integrity and with dignity. Farewell, hedgehogs. Thank you very much, President Dean, for a profound and inspirational talk. I took two words from that which have great meaning, integrity and value, and a third word which I have to go on Google and look up a little further. That's the hedgehog. <laughs> but I'm determined to do that. Thank you very much for those inspirational words. I'd ask President Dean to come back to the podium. I believe he has another announcement that he'd like to make before I terminate the convocation. President Dean. Thank you, Mr. Chancellor. You'll be relieved to notice I have no notes, so this will be brief. It's important at convocation to take note of signal events in the life of the university. And I would just like to mention at the end of this convocation that this is the last convocation for Dr. Phil Wood, our Associate Vice President for Student Affairs and Dean of Students, a position he has held for 11 years in which he has made a most remarkable contribution to the quality of student life on our campus and has been an enormous support to the entire academic mission of the university. So please, please join me in acknowledging Dr. Wood. My word of congratulations, Dr. Wood, for your contribution over many years to the university. Congratulations and happy retirement. Uh, this has been a, uh, a happy convocation. I'd like to remark on the enthusiasm that I noted from the social work side. In this, we've had nine, con nine, we will have had nine convocations this week. This is the eighth. And it gives 
President Dean and I and the Provost and others who are part of all of them an opportunity to, to see what style and level of enthusiasm there is from the graduands and their extended families. And I have to report again this year that the nurses are number one. But I was impressed with particularly the Bachelor of Arts and Bachelor of Social Work degree recipients who certainly applauded each other and had a degree of enthusiasm that was marked. So congratulations to you. We uh, have come to the end of the formal program. Uh, I just announced that immediately following this convocation, a reception will be held for the graduates and their guests in Hamilton Convention Center, room Wentworth Room C. And flowers that have been, del been delivered for graduates will be available at the coat check in the main lobby. I'd just like to add my congratulations to you all and best wishes the next phase of your lives. Please remain standing at your seats until the academic procession and the graduates have left the hall. I'd ask you to rise and join with me now in the singing of our national anthem. After the singing of the anthem, the convocation stands adjourned.